Right. Um, my name is Duray Naig. Um, I work in a unit that deals with problem fractures, and among some of the problem fractures are infected non-unions and late infections and fractures. So um, Bob's asked me and Badri to present to you some of the fundamentals that dictate our current practice in dealing with this clinical problem. And I hope that at the end of this, you have some salient points about how we approach this problem and how we would like you to approach the problem if you were to face this in the future. So these are the disclosures for the two speakers that are going to be involved uh, in presenting this. So like in arthroplasty, debridement is one of the key steps in dealing with late infection. And it carries many similarities to dealing with open fractures too. But here, the debridement is about removing or decoupling the non-viable material from the healthy. And this includes implant, it includes bone, and it includes soft tissue. There is a very good study published by the Oxford group when Hamish Simpson was there. And it was about looking at the margins of debridement and the recurrence of osteomyelitis. So let's look at this slide. And you can see that you have on the X scale, time in months, and on the y-axis, the infection-free survival. When you perform a wide debridement, there were no recurrences. This was a prospective study, and they had no recurrences when a wide debridement was done for chronic osteomyelitis. When they performed a marginal debridement, which is where the clearance margin at surgery was less than five millimeters, they had about a 30% recurrence. If they perform an intralesional debridement, all recurred within one year. So the quality of the debridement and the margin of clearance affects your infection-free survival. If you look at the group two, that's, there's even more information to be had from the patients who were part of group two. 30% of those patients had a recurrence within the first two years. And these were patients that had a clearance margin of less than five millimeters. When they subanalyzed this group, they found that all the recurrences occurred in patients who were called type B hosts. These were patients who had some form of either systemic or localized comorbidity, whether that's a vascular supply issue, diabetes, smoking, et cetera. But they also found that if these patients were subject to a wide debridement, then they would get the same survival free uh, interval as group one patients. So, the quality of the debridement is an important step in managing late infections and infected non-unions. So if we know that as a starting point, how do we tailor the extent of debridement based on the fact that we have an infected implant or an infected fracture? How do we remove enough, not too much, not too little? We have imaging modalities. Now, until recently, and I'd say recently in the last five years, in Liverpool, we relied heavily on a combination of plain x-rays, CTs, and MRIs. But in the last five years, we've moved heavily towards using the PET scan, the PET CT scan, because we find the images it produces so clearly tells us where the problem is, far better than interpretation of CT alone or even CT with MRI. And in this systematic review, it clearly shows that the sensitivity and specificity of a PET CT lies above that of MRI and CT alone. Fine, so we know how to localize where the problem is, we know the margins of clearance that we need to achieve when dealing with late infections and when dealing with 
infected non-unions. But if we're going to achieve this surgically, the consequences of producing a wide excision, as said by the previous speakers, is we're going to have problems because our surgery, fair enough, will remove the non-viable tissue, but we produce a new problem, and that new problem is dead space and wound closure issues. And for that, you need to have the ability, either by yourself or through your team members, to be able to repair the bone defect and repair the soft tissue defect. So to illustrate these fundamental principles, Badri and I are going to take you through just two examples of infected fractures, late infected fractures that have come to our unit. So this is the first example. So, uh, this is a fairly simple case. It's a 45-year-old insulin-dependent diabetic, sustained a close fracture of the tibia, um, junction of proximal and middle third shaft, treated elsewhere. I am nailing on day two, no problems with wound healing. Eight weeks after that, he gets an abscess over the um, proximal locking screws. It's drained, and he's put on oral fluoxacillin because it grew staph aureus. He's doing okay, and then at 11 weeks, he gets another abscess there, but this time it's red over the entry wound of the nail as well. So he was referred urgently. Uh, we have a fairly uh, easy system of referrals on uh, Adobe Acrobat forms that people fill in, and the, the forms are vetted by us, and we decide whether to see the patients immediately i.e. within the next two or three days, or whether they can wait a week, or whether they need an inpatient transfer. I saw this chap uh, about three or four days later. He had recurrent redness over the locking screw wound, but he was mobilizing full weight bearing. His CRP was 14, and he was asking me, you know, I'm feeling fine. Uh, what, uh, I'm okay, it's a bit red, it's a bit swollen, but I'm okay. So that's this picture. I haven't shown you the bottom, it's, it's, it's well locked. And you can see the fixation looks stable. And at the back, there's actually some callus. So it's, it's not unstable. He's walking on it without pain. And except for these episodes of redness, you know, he's not too bad at all. What do you do with him? Is the fracture infected? Is the entire medullary canal infected? And does it really matter whether the fracture is infected, whether the proximal bolts are infected, or whether the whole of the canal is infected? Uh, how do we find out? This was a case from about three years ago, and that's a uh, PET CT scan that I sent this guy for. Again, if we book it urgently, they do it for us within two or three days. And we have uh, a team of nuclear medicine guys who are very interested in musculoskeletal infection, and they actively seek feedback from us about their reports, etc. So it's a kind of learning cycle for all of us. And you can see that the uh, scan has been reported as showing infection around the proximal locking bolts, but not around the fracture site and not in the canal. So this was about three years ago when I was still dubious about how good scans were in delineating medullary infection. So if I were to see this report now, I would treat it as infection around the locking bolts alone. But um, Here's our uh, Friday meeting. What do we do? This three of us chatting about the patient. Do we, one of the options is continue with flu clocks, retain the implant and suppress, take it out, one stage exchange nailing. Uh, we are not uh, Elizar of only uh, unit. We do a lot of IM nailings and platings of tibial fractures. The other option, do we take it out and do a two stage exchange nailing? Do we remove the IM nail and use an Elizaro frame? Or do we say, you know, resect the fracture, no point, resect the fracture and do a bone transport? And each of these has enormous uh, implications to the health service, enormous implications to the patient. And you're looking at retaining implant and suppression, he can go back to work the next day versus resection of fracture and bone transport, nine months of treatment. And you've got to base all this. He's an insulin-dependent diabetic, but recently he says, you know, he's an editor of a local newspaper. He says, my control is not good. And he's had known staphylococcal infection around the nail. 
but the implant is stable, you know, he's walking on it, and there's no skin breakdown at all, the fracture is fine. So what do I do? Um, the week after, took out the nail, I treated it as a diffuse medullary infection, overdrilled the locking bolts, pulse lavage, calcium sulfate antibiotic, and put a monolateral X-fix on. Interestingly, he grew staph aureus only from the proximal locking bolts and one of his medullary samples and not from the rest of the samples. So I think the pet was very right in localizing the infection very precisely to the proximal tibia and not to the medullary canal. So four weeks after that, he has a standard Elizero frame. I've not opened the fracture site because it's not infected, but the advantage of this early referral, the moment you had a problem, he picked up the form, sent it across to us, was that in about 30 weeks, the frame was 30 weeks from the injury time, i.e. eight months from the uh, fracture itself, the guy is fully healed, and we think we've won. So one of the, uh, you know, you, everybody gets complications after I am nailing, but if you have a problem with it, if you have a doubt, if it's red, you're not sure what's happening, the advantage of picking up the phone or sending a form across and getting the patient seen is that, uh, you know, you, you have units where hopefully there's a variety of investigative options available and a variety of treatment options available for uh, what has been a fairly good result. So that scenario of an infected intramedullary nail in the tibia, although infection generally after trauma is not common, is not that rare, and you've all been in that scenario. The second case we chose to illustrate is in the femur. So this is a young person who was involved uh, with multiple sustained multiple injuries in a road traffic accident, and off note for this presentation is her femur injury. Now, she had a spanning external fixator applied because of her other injury, she also had a pelvic injury, and this spanning external fixator for this uh, femoral shaft fracture was then exchanged for a plate about 10 days after the injury. The pelvis was also stabilized. And as you can see from uh, the images, so you may not be able to see, it's, it's quite distant, but this was plating, although done in a bridge fashion, uh, was done through an open technique. And bone substitute was placed around the fracture site. The point at which we got to hear about this was about four months after the injury. And this is what the x-ray looks like four months after the injury. Now, I want to draw your attention that whilst you see callus formation around the fracture site, you can probably see lysis around the screws. In addition, the clinical features are that of increasing pain and swelling around her thigh associated with marked redness. So I think the diagnosis of infection or the suspicion of infection is not in doubt. I'd like to share with you a couple of other signs that may be helpful for your practice. If you look at the middle image carefully, you might be able to see that on the medial cortex of the femur, there is new bone formation. There is periosteal new bone formation. And you shouldn't be seeing periosteal new bone formation at a site that is distant from the fracture. So something is stimulating the periosteum uh, to produce bone at a site that is distant from the original fracture. Additionally, you can probably see the amount of lysis around the screws, and those of you uh, who practiced plating before locked plates came into being, that did not appear strange because sometimes the mode of failure of these old-fashioned plates was for the screws to toggle. But look very carefully and you'll see that one of the screws is in fact a locked screw. And that's not the mode of failure of a locked screw. So here we have lysis around the proximal screws suggesting that the lysis is not necessarily induced by movement but induced by bone resorption created by bacterial infection. So what do we do here? Shall we suppress and maintain as we can see some callus around the fracture site? and hope for the best? 
or shall we remove and revise? Well, let's try and see how much of this, as we've already said, the clinical suspicion is one of late infection, is involved by infection. <clears throat> and here is the PET-CT. The PET-CT lights up not only along the plate, but lights up across the entire fracture site, and it also lights up with the image to your left in the subcutaneous tissues, indicating that there may be an abscess there. So I think the decision here as to what to do is fairly straightforward. Yeah. This entire fixation requires revision and it requires not only a debridement of the fixation sites, but also of the fracture site. So, the decision that we took after discussing this was to actually debride the areas infected. And the clinical findings that we found at surgery was true enough in keeping with the PET CT and abscess. Very much necrotic tissue around the original fracture site and around those screw holes that had signs of lysis. So a resection of the fracture site, provisional stabilization, and use of topical local antibiotic delivery, whether you use this with calcium sulfate as we do, or there are other proprietary makes that allow you to deliver antibiotics locally. Two months of interval antibiotics. This is a young lady in her mid-20s, and then to proceed with a reconstruction of the bone loss that was created by the resection of the fracture site. So as you can see here, those time intervals you see are nine months and 11 months, not post debridement, but post original injury, which considering the, the nature of the injuries that she sustained are reasonable time frames provided the patient with the problem is referred early to a unit that can deal with the infection early. These are the final x-rays. This is a technique we use in Liverpool of plate after lengthening so that the time spent in external fixation is markedly reduced. This young lady was spe uh, spent just under three months in this reconstructive external fixator and had that substituted uh, with a plate. We were confident that we had the infection under control and were thereby happy to substitute another internal fixation device after the restoration of leg length. So this allows you to rehab much more quickly, allows you to get rid of the external fixator much more quickly. And this plate is inserted in a submuscular fashion. So this is 14 months post original fracture, eight months post original uh, surgery for the infection. These are her final x-rays. She's now more than two years of follow-up with no recurrence of infection. It might be interesting to know that when she came to our clinic recently, uh, she brought an additional person. And we worked out from the, from the age of the child that the child must have been conceived not after plating, but whilst the fixator was still on. So. <laughs> So don't let anyone tell you external fixators stop you moving around. <laughs> so just to share some comments with you about having a go with late infections, many of you have an arthroplasty practice, and many of you are fully trained to treat fractures. And you may already treat your arthroplasties and your infected arthroplasties. And I wouldn't blame you if you add those two statements together and say, well, I can then treat infected fractures. There is a slight difference. If one of the very important steps is the quality of debridement, if you're an arthroplasty surgeon, you would remove the arthroplasty, you would remove if you used cement, all the cement, and you would remove any of the surface bone that looked unhealthy. Knowing that if you came back at a second stage, if you did this at two stages, or if you did it at one stage, you can replace that missing bone by the implant. You can choose a bigger implant, you can choose different spaces in your implant, and you can make up for that missing bone that you've taken in your debridement. But it's different with fractures, because if you have a diaphyseal fracture, if you have a metaphyseal fracture, 
unless the original plan was to treat the fracture with an implant, with a replacement implant, you'd have difficulty in replacing that bone unless you train to, to replace that bone using a variety of techniques, some of which do not necessarily uh, involve frames. So if you're going to have a go at treating late infection and infected non-unions, you need that team that's been alluded to by all the previous speakers to literally work out what's going on, what you're going to do, and when you actually do it, how you do it together. And you need a host of people uh, working with you. And then you've got to ask yourself, well, you know, you've got a busy practice. Do I have time to fit these types of cases on my practice? And have I really got the background to remove and rebuild? Have I got the facilities at my hospital? Often, when you see these late infections, one of the decision-making processes that goes through your head is should you rebuild this or should you remove the limb? And you need to ask yourself, have I, am I the right person to help this patient come to a decision whether it should be an amputation rather than a reconstruction or a treatment of that infection? So if I had to just summarize what Badri and I have just said to you here, it's a lot more outcome cost and time efficient if you're faced with a deep infection or a late infection after fractures to refer to your local unit that is set up to deal with it. And, you know, to quote uh, a quiz phrase, really, this, just one line, just pick up the phone, call a friend, but call a friend early. Thank you. <laughs>